This episode has had several scenes from the originally PC-exclusive cutscene movie The Introduction Removed due to them being claimed with content ID. If you want to see the episode as it was intended, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker and support the channel for less than $2 American a month. And if you want, you can cancel your patronage right afterwards. Without further ado, here is the episode. Warning, this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Your discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight, on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Justice, Paranoia, and Cocaine. Tonight we will examine the fascinating life of a man who went from a two-bit criminal lawyer to a washed-up criminal record producer, and the hazardous detours he took along the way. A supposedly educated man who made a name and a living representing some of America's most notorious and psychotic killers. I Shut up, Ken! We will follow his journey from humble origins in the Sunshine State to rock bottom in the middle of the desert, all the way to his unlikely recovery working for the famous rapper Mad Dog. We will see laws broken, drugs taken, and assassinations escaped as we document the criminal history of Vice City's own Ken Rosenberg. This episode of Grand Theft Auto Biography is brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon. My goal for this channel is to be 100% fan funded, allowing me to cover whatever I want without having to rely on AdSense and appeasing the copyright gods. If you want to help this channel, you can donate below with the paypal.me link in the description, the YouTube thanks button below the video, or you can sign up on patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker and get early access to all of my work, access to all of the music from my shows and permission to reuse them in your own work, a download catalog of every video produced for the channel, access to the patron only discord server for weekly game nights slash movie nights with me, and your name in the credits. Help me reach my Season 3 goal so I can continue producing shows for you guys for a long time to come. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the show. Ken Rosenberg was born in 1953 in presumably Vice City, Florida, although this remains unconfirmed by medical records. Ken's childhood is a mystery, as are the identities of his parents, but if we assume he was indeed born in Vice City, perhaps at the Ocean View Hospital just down the road from his office, then we can also assume that Ken's parents had been locals themselves. Whether or not this was indeed the case, we know that Ken would develop an interest in practicing law from, we imagine, a young age. According to our investigations, Ken did indeed attend law school, and therefore passed his state's bar exam, receiving his license sometime in his early 20s. However, it is widely suspected within his own industry that Ken cheated on his exams, through unknown means, but we must remember this is merely conjecture. Sometime before age 25, Ken would gather the resources necessary to establish his own law practice in Washington Beach Vice City, K. Rosenberg & Company, running it out of the Hotel Harrison on Washington Street. Exactly what Ken's practice was like in the early days remains unknown, however given his latter clientele, it's possible that Ken received funds and or other assistance from less than reputable sources when first opening up shop, but this is merely our own speculation. What we do know is that by 1978, Ken had begun to represent, or at least cultivate a relationship with, the likes of the Liberty City-based Ferrelli crime family, who had spread their criminal tendrils as far and wide across America as they could manage. Ken, being an opportunistic man with no objections to actually breaking the law when it suited his own interests, would eagerly develop a business relationship with the Ferrelli family, presumably representing any and all of their interests in the city when possible, even if back then said interests were fairly minimal compared to their Liberty City operation. Ken would represent the likes of Giorgio Ferrelli primarily, who is thought to have been the man in charge of Ferrelli operations in the city until his cousin and boss of the family, Sonny, became interested in expansion many years later. 
By 1984, K. Rosenberg and company would be booming business-wise, representing the likes of many criminals from all walks of life, and acquitting them of their most heinous breaches of the civil contract. His firm would even bag a client in the Vice News Network who employed Rosenberg's team for official legal advice, in exchange for free publicity on the radio. Street rage descended on Vice City today as some drivers succumbed to the desire to ram and chase each other at high speed. Witnesses in downtown reported that some drivers were even seen to be discharging firearms at one another. Our legal team, Rosenberg and Company, urged citizens to quote the Second Amendment should they face charges. VNN, thinking for you so you don't have to. By 1986, Rosenberg would finally get his big break when the boss of the Ferrelli family, Sonny Ferrelli, heard about the release of the infamous Harwood Butcher, aka Tommy Versetti. Having been responsible for the failed assassination plot which had given Versetti his nickname, Sonny would move to have Tommy relocated to Vice City and help build the family's territory and influence in Florida, while also conveniently keeping him far away from Sonny. In order for Versetti to begin establishing a presence for the family, with Giorgio presumably running non-drug-related businesses for them already, such as loan sharking operations, he would need a product to sell, and given that it was the 1980s, there was only one product the ravenous citizens of Vice City were hungry for, cocaine. Turning to their resident legal contact in the city, Sonny would task Rosenberg with setting up a deal to give Versetti the jumpstart he was going to need, after 15 years inside. Knowing all the city's key criminal players, and having prepared for just such an opportunity for the last eight years, Ken would quickly begin looking for potential sellers, and his first stop would be retired Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez. If there was anybody in the city who knew where to buy what Ken needed, it was him. Ken would presumably explain what the Frelli family wanted, and Cortez would happily and easily oblige, either putting Ken in direct contact with, or acting as a middleman to, the Vance crime empire, consisting of two brothers, Victor and Lance. The Vances had proven themselves capable drug runners in the city in 1984, when pushing the far more violent and powerful Mendez cartel out of the business, although Victor had desires to retire from the drug trade entirely. Finally given a chance to sell the 20 kilo shipment they'd been sitting on since dissolving most of their criminal businesses in vice, Victor, the brains of the operation, would wearily agree to selling, and coordinate with Cortez to set up an appropriate location for both parties to meet. It's uh, Ken Rosenberg here. Hey, hey, great, hey. Well, uh, I'm gonna drive you guys to the meet, okay? Now, I've talked to the suppliers and they are very uh, keen to start a business relationship. So uh, if all goes well, we should uh, be doing very nicely for ourselves, which is, you know, good. Okay, so they're brothers, okay? One operates the, uh, the business and the other one does the flying. Okay, that's them and the chopper. All right, here's the deal. They want a straight exchange on open ground. All right? Okay, stay tight, let's go. Got it? 100% pure grade A Colombian, my friend. Let me see it. The greens? 10s and 20s, used. I think we have a deal, my friend. <laughs> oh, shit! Ken would drive Versetti along with Ferrelli Associates Harry and Lee to the docks in Viceport for the meet, a straight open ground exchange. Unfortunately for everyone involved, the deal would be ambushed, resulting in the death of Harry, Lee, and Victor Vance, with Lance, Tommy, and Ken escaping by the skin of their teeth. I poked my head out of the gutter for one freaking second and fate shoveled shit in my face. Go get some sleep. What are you gonna do? I'll drop by your office tomorrow and we can start sorting this mess out.
With the Ferrellis' money and coke both gone, Cam would be paralyzed with fear about what his bosses might do knowing the deal he set up went sour. With Versetti's assurance that he would help Ken to clean up the mess, he would retire to his office in Hotel Harrison and stay up all night trying to calm down, with excessive amounts of caffeine. Go get some sleep, he says. <laughs> I have been sitting in this chair all night with the lights off drinking coffee. This is a disaster. We are so screwed, man. These gorillas, listen to me, are gonna come down here and rip my head off. It's re ridiculous. I did not go to law school for this. Okay, now what the hell are we gonna do? Shut up, sit down, relax. I'll tell you what we're gonna do. You're gonna find out who took our cocaine, and then we're gonna kill them. That's a good idea. That's a great idea. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Oh, there's this retired colonel, Colonel Juan Garcia Cortez. He's the one that helped me set up this deal well away from Vice City's established thugs, okay? Now listen, he's holding his party out in the bay on his expensive yacht, and all of Vice City's big players are gonna be there, okay? I have an invite, of course I have an invite, but there's no way that I'm going out there sticking my head out the door, no I way, not I told you, happen. shut up, I'll go myself. Oh, whoa, 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 hey, I like 1978 too, but you know, this isn't gonna be a beer and strippers do. I mean, no offense, but I think that you might turn heads on the runway for the wrong reason. What's wrong with the way I'm dressed? Okay, look, here, stop by Raphael's, tell him I sent you. He'll make you look respectable. Okay, go, come on. Paranoid and scared stiff of mob repercussions, Tommy would attempt to assuage Ken's fears by doing the dirty work for him. Being an active Vice City socialite and a man who made his career knowing the who's who of the city's underworld, Ken would have an invitation to one of Juan Cortez's elaborate parties aboard his yacht docked in Ocean Beach. But given the circumstances, Ken would be too afraid to attend, and Tommy would go in his stead to investigate. Ken would remain at his practice and attempt to keep his composure, looking for leads, all the while maintaining his regular day job of criminal lawyer. When Tommy returned from Juan Cortez's party, he wouldn't bring particularly helpful news, informing Ken that a street lead would be necessary to track down the thieves, if they were going to make any progress anytime soon. Ah, well I hope you're having a good time, because I'm going out of my mind with worry here. What did you find out? That there are more criminals in this town than in prison. We need a lead from the streets. Okay, let me think, let me think, let me think. Ah, I got it! Okay, there's this slimy, some music industry slimeball. Goes by the name of Kent Paul. Anyway, he's got his nose so far up most of Vice City's ass that if anybody knows the whereabouts of 20 keys of coke, it's this guy, all right? He's always at the Malibu. I'll go pay him a visit. Take it easy now. Ken would send Tommy to meet with well-known cokehead and manager of the band Love Fist, Kent Paul, at the Vice City Malibu Club. And luckily for both of them, Paul would actually manage to give them their first substantial lead in a chef who was rumored to moonlight as an assassin, Leo Teal. Tommy would interrogate Teal and in the process meet the brother of the dealer killed alongside Harry and Lee, Lance Vance. No closer to actually knowing anything about who robbed them, Ken's paranoia would only get worse when the Ferrellis began applying further pressure on the overstressed lawman. Furious that their money had not yet been found, Sonny would demand that Ken do the family another favor in the meantime, or else. When Sonny's cousin, also presumably based in Florida, Giorgio, was facing a five-year prison sentence on fraud charges, Ken would be tasked with making sure the jury had a change of heart. Unfortunately for Ken, his skills as a lawyer, while good, were not perfect, and his attempt to persuade the jury of Giorgio's innocence would fail miserably, which meant that it was time for Tommy to take a crack at it his way. Ah! Oh, oh, for God's sake, it's you! Oh, jeez! I'm gonna need new pants! Hey, those psychos from up north, they've been on the horn, and they're coming down here soon! Now where is the goddamn money?! Relax, relax. We're not at that part oh, yet. Oh, I thought that you were taking care of this! I really did! And now those guidos say we gotta do them a favor! You mean I gotta do them a favor? Oh, oh of course that's what I mean. Do I look like I can intimidate a jury? I couldn't intimidate a child, and believe me, I've tried. Now look, it's either that or Ferrelli's cousin Giorgio gets five years for fraud. You gotta take these guys out! I understand. Help the jury change their minds. Don't worry about no, it. No, 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 no! I tried that! The jury case didn't go so well. So make them change their minds. While Versetti attempted to follow the trail on the streets, Ken would continue using the resources at his disposal to give them as much leverage as possible. He would meet with local real estate mogul Avery Carrington and recruit his help in locating their missing money and drugs, provided that Tommy helped him first. 
Avery goes without saying. Tommy, Tommy, any progress? No, 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 no. Tell me later. Tell me later. Tommy, this is Avery Carrington. I believe you met at the party. Not in person. Howdy. Avery here has a proposition. <clears throat> Haven't we got other things on our mind? I'm trying to keep the wolves from the door. So could you please cut me some slack? I'm stretched like a wire, and even if I'm dead by the end of the week, I'd like to think that I didn't die poor. Now just okay? calm down, both of you. Son, you help me, and any greaseballs giving you a hard time, I'll see to it they take a long dirt nap. Okay, what could I do for you? This delivery company's got its depot on some prime land. They won't sell. They're hanging on like a big old prairie rat. So we gotta go in there and smoke that vermin out. Head on down there and stir up a hornet's nest. The security will have their hands full, and then you can sneak in and put them out of business. And you could drop by Raphael's for a change of clothes. You might be there a while, but yeah, go for it. Should be a riot. If the balls drop like they should, stop by my office sometime. Tommy would somewhat reluctantly oblige Avery and instigate a riot at the Spand Express lot near Avery's building site, and later, flat out destroy an under construction office development in western Washington Beach. Meanwhile, Ken would wait with bated breath as Tommy made slow but steady progress on locating the party responsible for ambushing their deal, and in the process, also be forced to constantly bail Tommy out of jails across the city whenever he ended up on the wrong side of the local authorities. In our investigations, we managed to obtain an alleged conversation recorded at the Washington Beach Precinct of the Vice City Police Department between Mr. Rosenberg and a VCPD officer, whom we are told was fired shortly after the encounter. Vice City Police Department, Washington Beach Precinct. Officer Lundusky speaking. Tommy Versetti is an innocent man! Ah, you must be Mr. Versetti's lawyer then. Listen, pal, don't even bother me with this nonsense today. I just watched this psycho chainsaw man to death in the middle of the street, and I ain't in the mood. Officer! You really think my client was capable of that? A fucking course I do. I saw him do it. I see why they called him the Harwood Butcher. Tommy Versetti walks right here, or we sue for defamation. Oh, you gotta be shitting me. Defamation? Everybody's heard about him down here at HQ. We got eyewitnesses nailing him in Vice Point. My client wasn't even in town today, and you know it! You're getting on my last nerve, pal. You really think all these people are wrong about him looking like the suspect? Of course he looks like the suspect! That don't make him guilty! You look like an idiot! That doesn't mean you are one! Idiot? You four-eyed, snot-nosed swindler! Versetti walks right now, or there's going to be hell to pay. Well, considering I'm getting promoted to sergeant tomorrow, I'm not too scared of you. You're just a lawyer. Now, if your killer boss here was making the threats, maybe I'd be scared. Tommy Versetti is a kind man, a generous man, a civic-minded man, but he does not appreciate being called a killer officer. Oh, he doesn't, does he? Well, I'll be sure to write that down in a memo entitled Pot Meets Kettle. Come on, officer! Tommy Versetti wasn't even in Vice City on the day in question. Oh, this fucking guy. You really think I'm gonna buy that? I got five different people identifying him entering the building with a gun and a chainsaw, and according to them, he both shot and chainsawed at least half a dozen people, including- Tommy Versetti doesn't even own a gun! How could he do that? How could he? Now let him go. Doesn't own a gun? What kind of gangster doesn't own a gun? Not the kind of gangster who mutilates somebody in broad daylight, I tell you that. You know, and I know, Tommy Versetti never did that. Maybe you know it, but I know this guy is guilty as the day he was born. And I swear if I was a sergeant, I would have had him transferred upstate already. Versetti walks or you can kiss your promotion goodbye, pal. Oh, now you're threatening me. I'm not gonna budge on this, buddy. I got eyewitnesses, I got videotapes from the Malibu across the street, videotapes from another hotel, I got evidence that he was there coming out of my ass. For sure he was there. But that hardly means he did it. Ah, oh, so we're making progress now. You're saying he was there. I see. It's really interesting how that works. Versetti walks right now. Bail or I sue? Go right ahead. My boss doesn't get back for another 20 minutes, and I punch out in 10. I won't have to deal with it until I'm sergeant. And by then, knowing the truth, I'll be able to shut this whole thing down. You wouldn't know the truth if you found it banging your wife. Now shut up and release my client. And your wife's not that great. What? You fucking... You, you think I don't know what I saw? Don't you dare talk about Belinda like that. Oh, really? Because you saw it. It must have happened. Ho, ho, ho. What a load of crap, and you know it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now you're starting to get it. I saw it. It happened. Just like that. No crap to be found here. Come on, officer, officer. Come on, what are you, drinking on the job? Never. I'm clean as a whistle, friend. Get Sergeant Polanski down here. That fat chump owes me a favor. Like I said, he won't be back for another 20 minutes, so you shit out of luck, and so is your murderer friend. My client is a very important man, and he 
won't respond kindly to these revolting accusations. Like I give a shit. I got all the evidence I need to lock his ass up for life. All your evidence is circumstantial bullshit and you know it. Circumstantial? Was it circumstantial when you became a two-bit criminal lawyer? We're trying to prepare a legal case, officer. Not sling accusations around like a pre pick dodo. I'll show you a dildo. My wife's got plenty to spare. I ain't releasing this psycho. I've never seen witnesses so shaken up before. In my opinion, you're wasting your time. You think your opinion is important here? We are talking about a man's freedom. What about the other guy's freedom to live with his head still attached to his torso? Don't make me get irritated with you, officer. You cannot substantiate your claims in any way, any way, shape, or form. For said he walks. Walks? I got him on multiple counts of murder, breaking and entering, disturbing the peace, evading authorities. These charges, they ain't worth the paper they're written on, and you know it. Well, these charges are exactly why your client ain't making bail while I'm on duty. You have no grounds for refusing bail right now. Sure I do. He's a goddamn maniac. My client is innocent. Your client wears Hawaiian shirts. You think that is going to stand up in court? That? No. I doubt they would be as judgmental as I am, unfortunately. Come on! He's an innocent man! Officer! We'll just see how innocent he is when the jury deliberates, pal. If I have to make a claim against the police department for this outrage, I will! Yeah, well, screw you, too. Lindusky, you're fired. For said he's going free. I cleared your shit. Get out. Uh, but, but, sir, I... Take that awful self-portrait with you. Eventually, though, Tommy would indeed manage to track down the thieves, thanks to Ken connecting him with Juan Cortez. And with help from Lance Vance, the two would storm the mansion of coke kingpin Ricardo Diaz, avenge Lance's brother, and take the Diaz crime empire for themselves. Or at least, for Tommy. Though their money had indeed been found, Ken would now find himself in a precarious situation. Still needing to keep in contact with the Ferrelli bosses up north, Ken would be responsible for apparently reassuring Sonny that Tommy's new operation was indeed a Ferrelli asset, and not what it appeared to be, his. Now both a Ferrelli lawyer and a Versetti gang lawyer, Ken would throw his weight behind Tommy primarily, who was now seeking to expand far beyond his original goals and take over Vice City himself. Oh, we gotta redecorate this place! We gotta make it look older! I can't stand this look! Tommy, what do you say? What do you say we put a bar in the- You're my lawyer, Rosenberg, not my interior decorator. Got it? Listen to me. The time to take over this town is now. It's all out there waiting for us. We need to start seizing territory. Let Vice City know we're the new players in town. You know what I'm saying? What you need is a legitimate front, Tommy. Real estate. It's never done me no harm. We need to start using some muscle. Or we can kiss all that hard work goodbye. Local business know Diaz is dead, and they're refusing to pay protection. Oh, we could try bribery. Bribery? Screw bribery. I'll show you how to make them scared. I'll be back here in five minutes. Perhaps due to his still stressful situation as a potential fall guy between the two very deadly organizations, Ken would around this time either develop or exacerbate a dangerous cocaine addiction. When Versetti purchases the Vice City Malibu Club as one of his many new business assets, Versetti would task Ken with setting up the office for his next big move, a bank robbery in Little Havana. Though he likely started doing coke to distract himself from his many potentially life-threatening predicaments, Ken would quickly become even more high-strung, but simultaneously eager to help in the robbery, something Versetti would disregard time and time again. Tommy! Hey, Tommy, look at this. This is great. I've got us this mini bar installed. We got a whole bar downstairs, Ken. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, I got the chalkboard you asked for. Ah. That's the benefit of a law school education, the ability to follow instructions. No, it is safe. Oh, all right, well, let me think. Safe, safe, safe. I got it. This guy will blow you away. Ah, nah, that schmuck, he's on the inside. Where inside? In a police headquarters cell awaiting transfer. I think he's about to get paroled. After pointing Versetti towards expert safe cracker Cam Jones, whom Versetti breaks out of prison, Ken would barely skip a beat at asking to fill one of the remaining roles needed for the heist, fueled by excessive amounts of cocaine pumping through his veins. But unfortunately, or more likely fortunately for Ken, Versetti would be wise enough to keep Ken in charge of what he knew best, the money, recruiting additional help through Cam Jones' knowledge of the city's best marksman in supposed veteran and all-around lovable nutcase, Phil Cassidy. We need a stick-up man, you know one? Hey, Tommy! Tommy, Tommy, this stuff keeps you sharp, man. Woo! I could be your stick-up man. Stick him up! Stick him up! You ain't a stick-up man, you're an idiot! 
Now get yourself a drink and shut up. Hey, get out of my way! Yeah, 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 out, out, out. Relax. Cam, what do you think? Well, the best shooter in this town is a guy named Cassidy. Is that so? Yeah, a military guy, or thinks he is. I doubt he was ever in the army, but he certainly knows how to get a hold of guns. He'll be down at the shooting range. After finding and recruiting Phil, he would next connect the team with the best driver he knew in Hillary King. Though once again, a delusional and very, very high Ken would try to convince Versetti to let him be the driver instead. But once again, he would be ignored by the likes of Phil, Cam, and Tommy. When the time came to finally get the show on the road, Tommy and his team would meet one last time to go over the details of the plan. Perhaps feeling useless since his role in the Versetti crime empire became less important with Tommy's legitimate fronts and continuously refused in his desires to actively participate in crime alongside Tommy, Ken would remind the group of his importance and get a rare acknowledgement from Tommy for his contributions as the money man. As you can see, gentlemen, this is going to be the easiest buck we ever made. <laughs> Tommy, seriously, you gotta consider going into law. <sighs> what the hell are you smoking, man? This ain't no simple plan. Well, who needs a simple plan anyway? Take communism. Now that was a simple plan. Didn't do Russia any favors, huh? Calm down, all right? With a team like this, it's gonna be no problem. We got Cam on safe. Phil, you and me will handle security. And Hillary will drive the get I, I don't... Uh, <laughs> aren't you forgetting somebody? Somebody who helped you to no end in this town? Somebody Ken! Like... Ken, that's right. Ken here, he washes the money for us. And he keeps the drinks on ice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing here. Look, it's easy. Haven't you ever seen a movie? We walk into the bank. We wave the gun around. And leave very rich men. Tommy would continue buying up assets around Vice City to grow the Versetti gang, and Ken would continue bailing Tommy out of prison whenever necessary, or otherwise representing the organization. However, despite not being actively involved in the fighting, perhaps against his own wishes, Ken would continue to be a vital asset himself to Tommy, who seemed to, at the time, genuinely respect Rosenberg's contributions, as a lawyer and a crook, even if he was often hard on him. When the Ferrelli family see fit to finally pay a visit to the Versetti gang and tax its many businesses for their cut of the profits, Ken would be forced to deliver the bad news of an attack on the print works, which was only the calm before the storm for the war between Tommy and Sonny. Hey, hello, Tommy, Tommy. We got a situation over at Printworks. You better go and check it out. I don't know, some kind of mess or other. Things are messed up. I gotta go. Though Tommy would manage to both catch and kill all of the Ferrelli's tax collectors, for Ken this would only mean bigger problems. He would receive a call from Sonny himself, apparently threatening to kill Rosenberg's entire family for his apparent betrayal, which Ken likely tried to downplay. Tommy, 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 I had Sonny on the phone, okay? Are you with me? I don't know about you, but there's something about a man threatening to murder my family which really scares the crap out of me. What are you gonna do? Ken, take it easy. I am calm. Calm as a man can be when he's fearing for his life. Stay off the idiot fuel and look after yourself. No one's gonna take us out. I'll see you later. I am calm. Don't I sound calm? Must be impending death that is doing this to my voice. Completely calm and prepared for this inevitability, Tommy would keep his cool and get ready for a visit from Sonny personally, with plans to cheat his old boss and send him packing with a briefcase of counterfeit money made of his very own print works. Ken, however, already high-strung enough before his coke addiction, would continue to freak out, expecting Ferrelli Hitman to get him at any moment. What's going on? Tommy! Oh, good, good, good. Listen, listen, uh, listen. I like fish. I love fish. I love them as pets in bowls. Or his food on a plate, but as much as I love them, I don't want to sleep with them, okay? But right now, your Italian brothers are coming from up there to fit me with some cement shoes, and I- Shut up, Ken! Sit down! Lance, what the hell's going on? It's your friends up north, Tommy. They ain't too happy you kept their man. They're coming down to see the business today. They took longer than I thought. Guys, we gotta make this final. We gotta leave no doubt that this is my operation. Mine! Ken, you get the first one to counterfeit cash and put 20 mil in briefcases. Lance, you get the guys together. Tommy! Why? No big hugs for your old buddy. I've had 15 years out of the loop. I'm a bit rusty on family <laughs> etiquette. Oh, he's angry, huh, Tommy? Didn't I say your temper would get you into trouble, huh? 
There's three mil in the cases. How many was it? Ten? No, eleven men. That's how you get to be called the Howard Butcher. <laughs> you sent me to kill one man. One man! They hey, knew Tommy, I was coming, Sonny. Tommy! Watch your tone. Anyone would think you blame me for that unfortunate set of circumstances. Just take the money. Get the damn cash. You know, Tommy, I did what I could for you. I pulled strings, called in favors. I was your friend, Tommy. I hoped you'd see sense, see what's good for business. I trusted you, Tommy, and you disappointed me. But at least someone in your chicken shit organization knows how to do business. Isn't that right, Lance? Sorry, Tommy. This is Vice City. This is business. <laughs> you sold us out. No. I sold you out, Tommy. I sold you out! The real cash is upstairs in the safe. So, Tommy, what was the big plan? You think I'd just take the fake cash, save face, and run away with my tail between my legs? No. I just wanted to piss you off before I kill you. Depending on one's familiarity with the infamous Harwood Butcher, it may not come as a surprise to know that in the ensuing battle between Tommy and Sonny's organizations, it would be the Versetti gang who remained standing, with Tommy personally gunning down both the traitorous Lance Vance and Sonny Ferrelli, and fully establishing himself as the new king of Vice City. Having hidden during the fighting, a trembling Ken would emerge when the coast seemed clear, to find his friend and boss the last man standing, and at least for a time it seemed like Ken Rosenberg could breathe a well-deserved sigh of relief. Tommy? Oh my god, Tommy, what, what happened? What does it look like? It looks like you ruined your suit, and Tommy, that was a beautiful suit. Tommy, what on earth happened? Had a disagreement with a business associate. You know how it is. Tommy, I have a disagreement. I send them an angry letter. Maybe I pee in their mailbox. I don't start World War III. You know, maybe you should speak to my shrink. That stupid prick, Lance. Tommy, I never liked that guy, okay? He's neurotic, he's insecure, he's self-centered. The guy's an asshole. I'm glad you took him out. I don't think we're gonna be getting any more heat from up north either. Cause there ain't no up north anymore. It's all down south now. Wait, does that mean what I think it means? Tommy, baby! What do you think it means? That we're in charge. I mean, I mean that you're in charge. Oh, Tommy! You know, Ken, I think this could be the beginning of a beautiful business relationship. After all, you're a conniving, backstabbing, two-bit thief, and I'm a convicted psychotic killer and drug dealer. <laughs> I know. Ain't it just beautiful? Following Tommy Versetti's ascension to the kingpin of crime, Ken would continue to work for him in Vice City for several years, but Ken's habits would slowly dissolve the two's friendship over the course of the late 80s and early 90s. Presumably spending most of his time at the Malibu getting absolutely plastered, and slowly slipping in his duties as a lawyer and a friend. At some point between 1986 and 1992, Ken's addiction would be so bad that he would be disbarred from practicing law completely, and he would finally hit what he presumed to be rock bottom. With what little willpower Ken still possessed, he would by 92 check himself into a rehab center in Fort Carson, San Andreas to try and kick his destructive habit, and though he would initially succeed, his relationship with Tommy would be too far gone to salvage. But Ken would quickly realize not only was his reputation in the dirt, but being disbarred he was no longer a useful asset to the Versetti crime empire, or really anyone as far as he could tell. Determined to still try, he would attempt to reach Tommy from a payphone in Fort Carson. But fed up with Ken's antics, Versetti would refuse to even take Ken's call, let alone reconcile with the man. However, Ken, having spent many years deeply connected to several organized crime outfits across the country, would get one last chance to be useful, when a deal between the three Liberty City families selects him to be a moderating party. Looking to expand into the deserts of Bone County, and more specifically the fabulous Las Venturas, the families would pool together resources to open a casino themselves, Caligula's Palace, on the famous Venturas Strip, and Ken's job would be to ostensibly keep them all honest to each other, but in reality, to catch a bullet from the first family who sought to change the power dynamic. Having been selected personally by the Leone Don Salvatore, Ken would be under particularly intense pressure to deliver exactly what Leone wanted, which was his entire investment returned as soon as possible, or else. 
Barely able to enjoy his newfound power for even a few moments, Ken would quickly be brought back down to Earth, and realize the situation he was truly in, which seemed oddly, and terrifyingly, familiar. Right back to fearing for his life on a daily basis, and now friends with effectively nobody but a talking parrot named Tony, Ken would cower in his Caligula's office, awaiting what he believed to be his inevitable assassination. As if his misery could not be further compounded, around this time he would receive a visit from an old acquaintance he'd dealt with in Vice City. The only problem was, that acquaintance was Kent Paul. Kent Paul, here to see Rosie. Hey boss, there's somebody here to see you. Oh, go away! I have a migraine. Oh, Rosie, son, it's me, Paolo. Oh, God. My despair is complete. Okay, let him in. Rosie, how are you, me old son? I pray that one day I can escape my perpetual torment and retire in peace and comfort a million miles away from anyone I've ever fucking known, and instead, I get this. Come on, it's me, Kent Poe. Well, hello, Paul. What a pleasant surprise. Who the hell are these guys? These are my boys, Maka and Carl. Sir. You are any speckled doves, boss? I'm peeking on one right now. Top of the range, <laughs> man. Well, it's fitting as I sit here up to my neck in a river of shit with every mafia gorilla from Liberty City to Los Santos pissing in my face that you, Kent Paul, should witness it. What's the matter, Sam? Too numerous, oppressively insurmountable, and depressingly fucking typical, even to mention. It's all right, bruv. Paolo can help. Give us some space, would you, son? I'll give you a tinkle later. All right, for sure. Not you, Mecca. Oh, you twat. Unbelievable. Luckily for Ken, Paul had brought with him one of the most dangerous criminals in the state, Carl C.J. Johnson. After beating CJ in the desert thanks to their mutual contact in the hippie drug dealer, The Truth. When Ken becomes increasingly worried that a hit attempt by the Ferellis on the recently traumatized Sendako underboss Johnny would succeed, Carl would try to keep him calm by providing his services and helping to keep the situation from getting any worse. Ironically though, unbeknownst to Ken, it had been Carl who traumatized Johnny in the first place, as he worked with the San Fierro Triads to try and rob the very casino Ken was running. Oi Rosie, liven yourself up, Carl's here. <sighs> Hello. What's happening? Hey, there's some top fanny down at that pool pub, Zay. Eh? Oh, leave it out, Dimlo. What's wrong with you? Well, are you going to tell him or shall I? I'm really screwed. Crack on, Rosie. Spit it out. I threw it all away. Okay. I had the power, the money, the ladies, but I couldn't lay off the blow. So I went into rehab and everything went to shit. But so what? So when I came out, I started representing the Liberty City mob again. And that's how I ended up here. But no one family would trust another family to run the casino, so I was put forth as a neutral party. So now I spend my days waiting for one family to cap me and blame the other one. My only friend is a bird named Tony. I never fucked anyone over in my life who didn't have it coming to him. Shit, let me think about this. You're gonna have to break it down for me real quick. Okay, okay, the Sindakos are on the warpath. Okay? I mean, something terrible like has happened to Johnny. I mean, he's in a shock-induced coma at the hospital across town. Now, the Ferellis, they will take this opportunity to rub him out. Now, if any hit between the families succeeds on my turf, I will get the axe, bullet, machete, Okay, whatever. okay, relax. I'ma shoot over to the hospital and move the body or something. There you go, my love. Things ain't so bad, are they? <sighs> Bada-bing! Carl would manage to find and safely deliver Johnny to the Sendako Abattoir on the edge of town, and with his first victory in what seemed like years, Ken would immediately slip back into his addictive habits, with a little help from his friends. Oh, baby, I'm back! I am back! Let's get this show on the road! The good doctor has revived the patient. Thank you, Sweet thank has my you, son. Thank Sweet. You. So everything's straight now? No! Absolutely not! I'm still screwed! Absolutely screwed, but at least now I'm in the right frame of mind! <laughs> what the fuck are we gonna do? Any minute now, some mafia bullet is going to splatter my brains all over the wall! My wall? 
my beautiful wall. Ooh, you missed a bit. I love that. Forget about it. Oh, that's a great idea, Tony, but you know what? It ain't gonna work, okay? Not this time. No way, no way. Look, man, relax. Get a grip. Yeah, you're right. I need to get a grip. Take control. Yes, grab the bull by the horn. And show everybody who's boss. I'm the boss. I am the boss. All right, then. All right. Let's tear this That's what up. I'm saying. <laughs> so where we going? Details, details. Let's just get there. Rack them up, Mako. What's the matter with you? Oscillating frequently between supremely confident and cripplingly scared, Ken would get a much-needed morale boost from CJ, who seemed to be taking a liking to the disgraced Florida lawyer and accompany him to his meeting with Johnny Sendako. Okay, boss man, where to? We're gonna pay the Sendakos a visit, see how Johnny is, win him over with some <laughs> kind words during his convalescence. Well, yeah, sure. I can take you by there. Okay, great. We need a car. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> I gotta get out of this game. Shit, my nose is pissing like a racehorse. That is really good stuff. Drive faster, would you please? Come on, come on, come on. What, what are you, an old lady? So you trying to get out? Yes, God, yes. I want to do something safe and legal and boring with people that like me and have a wife and some kids and get divorced and fight for weekend access like everybody else. Listen, I'll see what I can do. Thanks, I'm just so tired of all this life and death bullshit. <laughs> Ah, oh, shit, shit's all down my damn shirt and everything. Uh, to my best shirt, too. Didn't this shirt look good on me? However, when Ken begs Carl to proceed further inside with him to calm his nerves, a reluctant CJ would unintentionally trigger a heart attack in the wheelchair-bound Sendako underboss, and an intense firefight would subsequently break out. What's going on? Did you forget something? No, nah, look, you go on in, I'ma wait. Uh... Look, you gotta come with me this once. If I pull this off, I can carry on. I know I can, but please, you gotta come with me. I, I, I'm i gonna squirt my ass all over the floor. Just this once, please. Please, please. Okay, please. okay, chill. <laughs> Shit, this can't look good. Listen, everything gonna be okay. Just remember, you the boss. I'm the boss? I'm the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the boss! I am the boss! Hey, boys. Tell your boss that Ken Rosenberg is here to see him. Ken who? K K Ken Rosenberg. <gasps> Ken Rosenberg! The guy that runs this town! So, uh, how's Johnny? Hey, he's doing much better. Huh. Yeah. He ate something this morning. Oh! Huh. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ken! Ugh! Ah, oh, Christ, this fucking thing. <laughs> Ken, come and stay. Yeah, how you doing? Pretty good. And you? Ah, I still got a little bit of the night terrors, a <laughs> touch of diarrhea, but I'll get through it. Huh, diarrhea. Cool. And yeah. uh, who's this? How you doing, Johnny? It's fucking him. It's him. Oh, oh my head. Oh, God. It's him. It oh, my heart. My heart. Uh, uh, uh. Damn, that nigga fucked up. But with CJ's help, Ken would manage to survive the encounter, just barely, following Carl as he gunned down numerous Sendako soldiers to escape the abattoir. Shit, we gotta get the fuck out of here. We need some wheels. Get me back to Caligula's. You calm down and follow my lead. Holy fuck, man. We work well as a team together, huh, CJ? You and me tearing this town up? Nobody can stop us. Nobody in the world. Johnny's a done deal, and so is his gang. Too fucking right they are, dumb pussies. Oh, fuck, I'm screwed. I'm fucking screwed. What the fuck am I gonna do? Shit, shit, shit! You just gotta hang in there. Play it dumb. I'll figure out a way to get you out of this. Just drop me at the airport. Nah, man. They gotta think you did. I'll think of something. I promise. Get in there and be cool, like you've just been out for a relaxing drive or something. Calm. Yeah, calm. I'm calm. Real fucking calm. I'm calm, Mr. Calm, Mr. Calm. That's me, Mr. Calm. Ken would saunter back into Caligula's, attempting to keep his cool, and not reveal his participation in the death of Johnny Sendako, but with the arrival of Salvatore Leone and Las Venturas, he would soon learn he had much bigger worries to concern himself with. Hello? Carl, it's me, Ken. Show the Leone family has be made guessing. their move. Salvatore's here. Now, he's taking over Caligula's. We're screwed. It's war for control of Venturas, man. War! War! There's word of some triad visit or something that should keep them busy. I'm calling from the bathroom. I gotta go. I really gotta go.
Though still completely unaware of the true extent to which Carl was screwing over the families he was working for, Ken would maintain his cover, and try to keep his mouth shut for as long as possible so as not to upset the easily perturbed Don Salvatore. Vouching for Carl's considerable skills as a gunman, Ken would introduce CJ to Mr. Leone at his Caligula's office, and unknowingly give Carl the perfect chance to conduct subterfuge for his planned heist by gaining Salvatore's trust. And who's this asshole? The name's Carl Johnson, sir. Before working with Mr. Rosenberg here, I had the pleasure of doing business with your son, Joey, back in Liberty City. You know my Joey? I like that. So, kid, what can I do for you? Well, Ken, if vouch for me, I'm a straight killer. Oh, but one man fucking army. A, a real dependable. Total fucking maniac, too. You know, the Ferrellis are sending over a crew to hit me. Their flight gets in soon. Traveling is a string quartet. <laughs> I was going to send some of the boys over as a little welcoming committee. But uh, maybe you can take care of it. Thank you, sir. I guarantee you, you won't regret this. Uh, maybe I should go ah! that, 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 Stay where you are, Rosenberg. I don't want you getting yourself lost. But Ken, always the fervent paranoiac, would continue to stir in his own fears of being capped by Salvatore, or one of the other two Liberty families breathing down his back. Starting to feel like he could trust Carl as a friend, Ken would appeal to CJ's good nature, and beg him to do whatever it is he was going to do, fast. Hello? You've hung us up to dry, I know it. Rosenberg? Yeah, soon to be wearing concrete shoes in a shallow grave in the desert, Rosenberg? I'm surprised you remember. Look, I ain't forgot y'all, man. Just hang in there. Easy for you to say this Salvatore guy might whack me at any moment. Thoroughly satisfied with CJ's performance as a hitman, Don Salvatore would hire Carl to perform an assassination on Marco Ferrelli at the St. Mark's Bistro in Liberty City, and on Salvatore's orders, dispose of Ken along with Paul and Macker in the process. Carl, it's my man. Mr. Leon? Looks like this piece of shit was right. You did a real number on those Ferrelli losers. Now it's time the Ferrellis found out what it means to screw with Salvatore Leone. How would you like to hit the St. Mark's Bistro? A hit in Liberty City? Cool. But I'ma need some backup. Take who you want. Well, I usually use these two. Hey, hey, remember all those jobs we did together, huh? Huh? You and me, Carl, remember? Huh? You know, you used to call me Killer Ken. Ken the Killer? Killer? Ice Cold Ken. That's me. And him too, I guess. Thankfully, Carl was not interested in killing any of his new allies, and instead only interested in robbing Caligula's with his triad friends running the Four Dragons Casino up the road. Alright, you guys better get out of Los Venturas fast. I'll be in touch. What about your backup, man? Will you be alright without us? Of course he will, you fucking moron! Come on! Shortly afterwards, Carl, along with his triad allies, would successfully rob Caligula's palace, but not before Carl ensured that Ken would be safe from Salvatore's wrath by lying to him and reporting Ken, Paul, and Macker all deceased. Hello? Hey, Carl, my boy. Mr. Leone. Everybody's talking about the job you did on that St. Mark's Bistro. Thank you, Mr. Leone. And you, uh, you took care of those three loose ends? Yeah, those poor saps ran into a little trouble along the way. You won't be hearing from Mr. Rosenberg again. Good boy, good boy. Now listen, you're gonna have to keep a low profile or people will start to make connections. So let's keep our distance for a while, huh? I'll call you. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Though Salvatore would inevitably discover CJ's role in the robbery, he would apparently never question Carl's killing of his three loose ends. Knowing that CJ had played the double agent supremely well when actually carrying out all of Leone's other orders, such as the assassination of Marco Ferrelli. As a result, Ken would finally be free of the threat of death for the first time in months, and be able to relax in parts unknown until a new opportunity came ringing, by way of his new friend, Carl Johnson. Hey Ken, how you doing? Who is this? It's Carl. Carl Johnson. Hey, Carl! Great! Guys, it's Carl! Great! I'm fucking great! Fucking amazing! I got a need for an accountant and a sound engineer, and I thought of you and Paul. Fucking amazing! Paul's great with figures, and I'd make a fucking amazing producer. This is... This is fucking great! It's amazing! Yeah, yeah, whatever you say, man, but look, see you soon. Fucking amazing! Finally seeing a turn of fortune, Ken would become the accountant for Los Santos rapper Mad Dog, alongside Kent Paul and CJ producing and managing the artist, respectively. Not long after getting his career back in order, Mad Dog would sell his first gold record, thanks to help from his new team, including Ken. It seemed as though Rosenberg had finally managed to find a place for himself again, without having to constantly fear for his life. 
Whoa, 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 whoa. I come in peace with Mr. Dog here, who has an announcement. My, I mean our first gold record. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, they heard about I it. I decided to get breast implants. Oh, 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 Joke on. Anyway, what's next? We should hit the casinos, roll some dice with Woozy. Nah, we gotta take care of shit here first. We going on tour, fam! Has anyone got a tissue? My nose is just, <laughs> yeah. it won't stop running. Is that, anybody? Yeah, I have. Over there. Uh, I'll pass. Carl, where are you off to now? Finna hit the block. See what's happening. Little to no information exists on Ken's life or career post-1992. Perhaps due to a desire to avoid the limelight in all respects, and avoid broadcasting his survival to the likes of the Leones back in Liberty City. We, however, couldn't care less about outing him. If you're out there, Ken, don't worry, I'm sure they're over it by now. Probably. Ken Rosenberg was a high-strung, frequently paranoid drug addict with a knack for getting himself into deadly situations. From a young age, Rosenberg seemed to aspire to criminal law in the most literal sense, actively attempting to cultivate a relationship with the Ferrelli family and mingling with the likes of Colonel Juan Cortez, Kent Paul, and many other less-than-legitimate businessmen with full knowledge of his client's violent or otherwise illegal proclivities. Ken was never worried about the moral cost of representing murderous thugs or psychotic killers, and even happily made some of them his closest friends, either out of a genuine attachment to them, or a desire to remain on their good sides and avoid their considerable wraths. Rosenberg was an intelligent man, having at the very least the knowledge and skills necessary to become a lawyer, even if he did cheat on his exams, and using his keen sense of opportunism to exploit the situations he found himself in when possible. Even if his law degree was built on a lie, Ken was inarguably a very effective defense lawyer in his heyday, managing to get Tommy Versetti off on bail numerous times when the evidence against him seemed beyond damning. He was also an expert at networking, and had little issue earning the respect of his fellow criminals with his silver tongue. However, when fearing for his life, Ken could become a dysfunctional mess, and clearly didn't deal with stress very effectively, turning to drugs as a crutch at the slightest hint of disruption to his otherwise smooth day-to-day. Ken also clearly had some ambitions to be more than just a lawyer working for criminals, as evidenced by his incessant attempts to be included on the El Banco Corrupto Grande heist, and his reminiscence while fighting alongside, or rather behind, Carl Johnson. Whether Ken actually had it in him to squeeze the trigger on an enemy remains to be seen, but he at least paid lip service to wanting a more active role in the criminal organizations he often represented, even if when given the chance to fight, he would usually choose to flee. Ken was in many ways everything wrong with the American criminal justice system, using every trick in the book to clear his clients of any guilt for their many, many substantial crimes, and with full knowledge that those clients were in fact guilty as all hell. Ken's primary concern seemed to be himself, and he showed little interest in developing long-lasting and time-testable friendships, romantically or platonically. Despite being plenty capable of socializing for business purposes, Ken seemed to have a great deal of anxiety outside of his business dealings, and especially following his disbarment from practicing law. It's possible Ken was always like this, though it seems fair to assume that following his disbarment, the loss of his old life in Vice City, and a friend like Tommy Rossetti, and nearly being killed on numerous occasions, he would only become more fearful of his fellow man, and less willing to engage in social activities without the aid of his real best friend, Cocaine. What all of this says about the man remains up to you, my dear viewer. It's arguable that Ken is among the worst of the worst here on GTA Biographies, not for his direct role in murderous affairs, but for the number of people who he deprived of a truly just verdict, when saving his criminal buddies time after time. However, it could also be said that Ken is arguably one of the least violent individuals we've ever examined on this program, as he himself isn't technically responsible for many crimes at all, and may therefore be one of the least offensive criminals we've examined. Perhaps it all depends on one's perspective. Was Ken Rosenberg a conniving, backstabbing two-bit thief? or a man misunderstood, just trying to make it any way he could in America. You decide. Ken Rosenberg is an interesting case when examining his potential criminal record due to his role as a man of the law himself. Technically speaking, Ken Rosenberg was never charged with or even overtly suspected of anything other than representing very dangerous men, even if his role as a money launderer and mob defense lawyer occasionally bled into active participation. 
With this in mind, we have attempted to compile a list of what we believe may have been some of Rosenberg's crimes, but we must emphasize that if it were possible to hold him accountable for any of it, there would most certainly be far more than we will be able to cover here tonight. That being said, let's look at what we think he could have been charged with if our justice system weren't so horribly skewed in favor of corrupted men like him, starting with possibly cheating on his state's bar exam. Conspiracy accessory drug dealing, drug dealing, and fleeing the scene of a crime when setting up a cocaine deal that is ambushed by the DS crime organization. Accessory intimidation of a jury, and destruction of private property when putting Tommy Rossetti onto the Giorgio Forelli case. Accessory murder and conspiracy accessory prison break when putting Tommy onto safecracker Cam Jones. Conspiracy accessory murder and armed robbery when having knowledge of the plan to rob El Banco Corrupto Grande in Little Havana. Accessory murder when present for Tommy Versetti's slaughtering of the Ferrelli crime family. Conspiracy accessory counterfeiting and money laundering when working for the Versetti gang in Vice City. Accessory murder and conspiracy Grand Theft Auto when hiring Carl Johnson to save Johnny Sindaco, with Carl killing several Ferrelli family goons in the process and stealing an ambulance. Accessory murder when witnessing Carl's slaughtering of the Sindacos at their abattoir in order to escape. And accessory murder when vouching for Carl's services as a gunman to Salvatore Leone who hires Carl to kill several hitmen. As we said before, if Ken was to be held accountable for the actions of his occasionally dishonest profession, then it seems likely this list would be ten times longer, given the many times he bailed men like Tommy Rossetti out of prison, or otherwise lessened the sentences of violent, dangerous criminals. However, if there's one thing that Ken Rosenberg could hold over practically every subject we have or perhaps ever will examine here on this program, it's that he ultimately was able to get away with everything by using the law to his advantage, instead of constantly falling victim to it. Ken Rosenberg was many things, a coward, a thief, and a con man, but he was also in many ways a truly American success story. Sort of. What makes a man take the criminal and criminal law so seriously? Is it simply too difficult to make it in this great nation these days without turning to a life of crime to make ends meet? Or are some people simply destined to wind up on the wrong side of the law in either a jumpsuit or a business suit? One thing that cannot be forgotten is that America is a dangerous place, and true justice can be a fleeting, illusory ideal. Stay indoors, people. You never know if your defense lawyer is secretly representing mobsters who would sell your organs for profit if given the chance. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Autobiographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching. Thank you to all of my patrons for making this series possible. And a special thank you to my very first executive producer patron, XX Anti Tricks Never Sorry 17. Myself and the Weasel News Network couldn't be more thankful for your contributions. Yeah.